Hi, and welcome to today's webinar, where I'm going to show you something very, very exciting. In the next few minutes, we are going to build a fully functional web application right on the spot. You'll walk away from this knowing how possible it is to learn these skills and build your own apps on your own. So let me guess, you are here because you've thought about learning how to code, right? Maybe you want to work for big companies like Google, Amazon, or even launch your own app one day, or you just want to earn a good living working remotely from the comfort of your home, earning upward of $1,000 living in your country. Well, I'm here to tell you that this dream is closer than you think. This is going to be fun and especially life-changing for you. So buckle up and let's get started. But before we dive in, let me take a quick second to introduce myself. I am ATO and I'm a full-stack developer with years of experience building real-world applications for businesses and individuals to help them achieve their goals. I've built tools that have helped people save time apps that people use every single day and now I'm on a mission to helping people like you become full stack developers. But if you think I was born a developer, you are wrong. I wasn't always a developer. In fact, I started with no coding knowledge, no background in tech and no idea on how to even start building an app. What I did have was a strong desire to create things and I knew that coding was the way to do it. So over time, I mastered the skills, freelanced, build a business and now I'm running the Programmers University where we help people just like you go from zero to full stack developers in less than no time. So if you're sitting here wondering if this is possible for you, let me stop you right there. It absolutely is possible. And by the end of this webinar, I'll show you exactly how you can join me and other students on this journey to become a developer who is of course highly paid. And do you know the best part? You need absolutely no prior experience, no previous degrees or certifications to get started. All you need is the willingness to learn, a laptop and an internet connection, which you obviously have if you're watching this webinar with me right now. Now, before we start, let me quickly address a few things because I know what might be running through your mind right now. Maybe you think that ATO, you must have some secret advantage. You must have something that is really allowing you to reach levels that I cannot reach right now. Your parents were developers, maybe, and encouraged you to learn tech skills. Maybe you study abroad or you were probably born with some special talents. Let me tell you this, I was just like you. I had absolutely no family in tech. My family didn't even know what programming was and didn't even know that you could use it to make a ton of money. I grew up in Cameroon, did most of my education there and only traveled abroad very very late so I learned everything entirely in Cameroon and I was in no way some genius who picked everything up in a week. I really really struggled at first, the terminology was so confusing, the syntax was so difficult to master, all the tools felt so overwhelming and it seemed like I would never learn this thing just because of how complex it felt. No one showed me how to do anything so I spent a lot of time trying to learn, a lot of time failing and I gave up several times. But I always came back up after giving up. So what happened was that I found the right resources, stayed committed to it and broke down my learning into simple and manageable steps. And that is exactly what I do now for my students at the Programmers University. Take complex things and make it simple so that they shouldn't have to go through all the hoops and troubles I went through when I was learning. So instead of taking 8 years to learn how to code as I did, you are going to learn it in only less than 12 months. So if you're sitting there thinking coding is too difficult, I want to be the one to break those doubts for you. Anyone can learn how to code, you just need the right guidance and that is what I'm here to offer for you. Now let's get to the fun part. I will show you how easy it is to build a real world app. In this session, I'll walk you through building a simple web app from start to finish. We are going to build a complete full stack application in no time which will be both useful and fun. If this is something that sounds fun and exciting for you, buckle up and let's get straight to the source. This kind of app can be used on a daily basis and this is something that you can easily build with the right full stack skills you will learn at the Programmers University. It's the type of app you can build for your client, a small business or even yourself to just impress your friends. But ultimately, we are here to teach you the skills that can land you a job and make you money eventually. So what are you going to learn during this session? During this session, you'll see how we build a front-end interface with HTML, CSS and JavaScript, 
set up a backend server using Node.js, connect the front end to the backend with API calls, and handle user interactions. This is basically everything you're going to be doing on a daily basis once you're hired as a full stack developer. You're going to learn how all those things are done in today's webinar. And now, before we get started with the coding part, let's start with the basics and define what even is full stack development. Okay, I know you're very excited to get started with building the app, but before we get started, it is very important for us to understand what is a full stack application. So in the next few minutes, we are going to talk about this and also talk about the benefits and what you can achieve learning full stack development. Firstly, let's define what a full stack application is. A full stack application is a web application that integrates both the front end and the back end. And the front end here is the client side and the back end is the server side in order to deliver a complete user experience. It provides everything needed for a user to interact, make requests, and receive responses. As you can see on the diagram on the right, a full stack application consists of the application first, which is what the user sees, and the web server, which is the backend and where all the logics and calculations are going on, and finally, the database, where your data is stored and retrieved. Next, why is it even called full stack? Full stack refers to covering all components of the application stack. This includes everything from what users see and interact with, which is the front end, to the behind the scenes processing and data management, which is the back end, and ultimately the database. So now let's talk about the core components of a full stack application in a little bit more detail. Firstly, we have the front end. The front end is the visible part of the application where users interact with. This layer focuses on layout, visuals, and user experience. If you've ever used Facebook, which you probably have, anytime you open the website, everything you see on the screen is the front end. So when you see images of your friend who recently posted, or when you see a post of your favorite artist, that is visible because that is the front end. What goes on in the back end now is, after you press maybe the like button, a request is being sent to the backend in order to store your like to your data and you can ultimately retrieve that like and see the overall like count. Now the backend, which is also called the server side, is a part that processes data and handles requests. This is where the application logic ultimately resides. And finally, we have the database. The database stores all the data, such as user information, settings, and content, which the backend later on retrieves and updates. We gave the example of Facebook at the beginning of this slide. So when you click on the like button, the information about your like is ultimately stored onto the database. And then the backend can retrieve this information and also update it. So for example, if you want to change your like from, let's say, a heart to a smiley emoji, the backend is responsible for changing those two information and it ultimately gets stored in the database. And once you want to see the total number of likes on the post, the backend then retrieves it from that database and sends it over to the front end and then you can see what's going on on your end. Now let's just briefly talk about how full stack components work together. Firstly, the user interacts with the front end interface. Then the front end sends requests to the backend. And then the backend processes this request and interacts with the database. And this interaction can be in the form of either storing data, retrieving data, updating data, or deleting data. And then finally, the backend sends data back to the front end, which displays it for the user. This final thing is called a response. Because once the user interacts with the front end, they send a request to the backend. And the backend has to send a response to the front end so that the user on the front end can know that their request was validated. And now you as a developer will ultimately send a response in a way that makes sense to the user who is interacting with the front end. So as we can see on the diagram on the right, this front end right here is what the user sees on their laptop. And now the request goes through the internet and then goes through the web services. The web services is basically the backend. And now it ultimately goes and stores a particular amount of data in the database and then retrieves some data and resends the response to the front end. So as we can see below here, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript are the typical languages used on the front end. 
Java, C Sharp are typical languages used in the backend, and SQL, PostgreSQL, and SQL Server are typical database languages. So for the front end, these are the three languages that mainly dominate. And then you have other frameworks and libraries like ReactJS, Angular, and several other frameworks. For the back end, there are several more alternatives. There is Java, there is C Sharp, there is even JavaScript for the back end, which is called Node.js, there is Python, and so much more. Same goes with the database. There are so many different database languages. What we have here are called SQL databases. There's also what they call no SQL database for the backend. So all this might seem confusing right now, but don't worry. The more you get into full stack development, the more you're going to understand this. And this is even going to become of second nature to you, become very easy that you even wonder why you ever struggled with this. And that is ultimately what we teach in the programmers university. So moving over to the next, let's look at examples of popular full stack applications. Firstly, we obviously have Facebook and we don't really need to talk about this, but Facebook is a full stack application, which consists of a front end and a robust back end supporting millions of users. Instagram too is a full stack application, which handles images, profiles, messaging, and live stream. And finally, we have Netflix, which manages large media libraries, personal recommendations, and playback. So there are several more full stack applications, anything you can think of, which has a front end side that the user interacts with and a back end, which handles complex data and also stores things to the database is a full stack application. So you see that with the knowledge you're going to learn in full stack development, you can actually use it to build such applications. Or even if you don't build these applications yourself, you can work in a company that is responsible for building and managing such application. So not only it is a high pain field to be in, it is also a very exciting field because you get to build things that change hundreds or even billions of lives all over the world. So now that we understand what a full stack application is, let's build one together. We are going to create a full stack weather app, which is not only a simple weather app, but that combines a responsive front end with a data driven backend and utilizes an external weather API. And the best part is we are also going to store weather data in our database that we will build from scratch and host locally by ourselves. And you'll be able to visualize all this data, see how you can handle requests in the backend and just do all these cool stuff that full stack developers do. And do not worry, I'm going to show you everything step by step. So you're going to see how possible it is for you to build a full stack app if you actually commit to learning the full stack skills that are required to build this. And we teach all that in the programmers university. So without further ado, Let's get straight to building our application now. So now that you've seen how possible it is to build your own full stack application, you've seen that it is really possible and it is not something that is out of this earth, like the way it is usually presented on the internet that is only special people who can build full stack application. Let us now talk about what is possible with full stack development. That is after you yourself, you learn the skills from scratch and are able to build this kind of applications within the next few months and ultimately be able to learn tech jobs. So firstly, you can work remotely for companies all around the world. Secondly, you can build apps for small businesses or startups. Thirdly, you can freelance and earn good money from clients who need apps built. And finally, you can learn a job at tech giants like Google, and there are so much more things you can do with your full stack skills, like even starting to build your own tech startup, because a tech startup is basically a startup revolving around a technology like an app, like a mobile application, a web application, and this is something that you'll be able to build yourself. So also building your own dream app, your own dream startup, and even raising funds around that is ultimately possible if you commit and spend the next few months learning full stack development in the programmers university. And if you're wondering the salaries of full stack developer, we are going to focus on these three main countries. The typical salary of a full stack developer in Nigeria ranges from 300,000 Naira to 7.5 million Naira monthly. In Cameroon, it ranges from 150,000 francs CFA to 3 million francs CFA monthly. And ultimately in Ghana, it ranges from 4,000 cities to 50,000 cities monthly. And there is also the salaries that you see mostly on the internet, which is the ones in the United States. And software developer salaries ranges from $80,000 a year 
to even up to $500,000 a year. And if you know about the dollar currency, you know that that is a lot of money, whether you're living anywhere in the world. Okay, now we are going to get started with building our very own full stack application. And this full stack application is not going to be any type of application. It's going to be a very useful application that you can even give to a school or give to a company if they want to manage students. And when you're going to learn full stack application very well, you can even modify this app or build it by yourself to even help other kind of companies manage other resources like even real estate companies because this main application we're building is to manage students and manage courses you can also build an application to help manage different types of businesses with this we unlock a diverse amount of potential that you can use to pour into other types of application that even have nothing to do with this one so let's get started and show you what we are going to build i'm going to show you step by step how to install the necessary tools, set up your backend endpoints, and ultimately build this front end that the user is going to use and be able to add students, delete students, update students, and do all those fancy stuffs. So let's start by adding a student. So in order to add a student, we'll come to this add student button, and then we're going to add a new name. I'll call him, I'll just give a random name. Let me just say Zhang, and then the email is going to be Zhang at gmail.com. He's registered to the social studies course and his enrollment date is October 27, 2024. And as you can see, you can put any enrollment date as it's very possible for you to enroll a student a previous day and make them start their courses in a later day. So we'll enroll them on November and then we save students. We see that we have saved these students and now we can see the student's data here. Another very interesting thing we can do to a student here is to edit their data. So if we want to add a different name to Zhang, we can give him Zhang and say Jordan. So once we save the student, what is actually happening is that we are saving it thanks to our backend and then the data is going to save in the database. I'm going to show you the data in the database in a few minutes. But let us first look at our application in more detail. Let's say we want to delete a student. If we want to delete a student, we have our delete button, which is right here. So we come over here, we want to delete this student, this a poly student. We click on the delete button. A pop-up is going to come up asking us if we want to delete the student. And then once we click on the delete button, we see a message here saying students successfully deleted. And we see that the students no longer exist in our database or in our dashboard. Same thing for the courses. If we want to add a new course, we can come here, add course, let's say biology studies. And then for the description, we'll say this is the study of living things. And then the duration can be 24 months because the duration here is months and what we are receiving here is an integer. So here for the active, we're going to leave it at active and then we're going to save the course. So we see that this is the new course added here. We can come and edit this course and change its data. We can also delete a course, but we're not going to delete a course right now. So something different that we're going to see is that once we added the course, once we come to add a new student now, we come to select course, we see that the course we just added has come over to the select course. So if we come to full name, we are going to add our student called Epoli, and then we can give the second name or the last name as Sandra. And then we'll say here, Sandra at gmail.com. We'll select the course, we'll give it the course biology studies, and then the enrollment date is today and then we save the student. We see that we have a new student added right here. And now if we take a good look at our database, I'm going to pull up our database real quick. So this is our database. We are using MongoDB for this application. We see that we have two collections. The first collection here is our courses collection and the second collection here is our students collection. So if we open the collection, so we see that the course we just added is not shown in our database. So what we'll do is just to click on this refresh button right here. And this biology studies now shows in our database. And this database is a local database because it runs directly on our PC. 
it's not found anywhere on the internet this is run directly on our pc and i'm going to show you how to set everything up and you're going to see how easy and how feasible it is to do everything that the developer does on a daily basis in a job if we go to the students collection we can refresh it and see different students we added so this is tony bradley so let me just put it side by side here this is tony bradley here this is zhang jordan and this is a poly sandra or oh, it's sandry instead i spelled it wrongly so you can see the actual data that is in here so here is the name of the student the email the course and this course here corresponds to the course id because one thing in programming is that if you want to access data from a different collection or a different table you have to reference that data using the document id and this is what we are done here so when it's students register to a course the course data that is added to the student's document is the course id so this first course corresponds to computer science right here as you can see this is the same id here and that will help us know that the student tony bradley is registered to the computer science course so this is basically what we are going to be building here i'll be showing you how to set up everything from scratch how to build everything and connect the front end with the back end and ultimately store everything in the database. So by the end of this session, you're going to see exactly how you can do to build your very own full stack application. And if you want to take it further, you can even start learning with us at the Programmers University from scratch and we'll take you step by step through all the processes we used here every single terminology we're going to help you understand it and help you build your own applications from scratch so let's get right into it so first things first we are going to install the necessary tools i assume that you're a complete beginner you don't really know what is going on so i'll start from scratch so firstly we'll install the tool that is going to help us write our code which this tool is called vs code so we are going to start by we'll write install vs code so the first thing that comes up is what we're going to select so we'll click on install vs code and then depending on which operating system you are on you download the version that suits your in your operating system so i am on windows so i'm going to click on windows and then the download is going to start automatically then i can click on download so i already have vs code installed on my pc so i'm not going to install it one more time but you if you don't have it installed you download the version that is suitable for your operating system so if i were to download it i'll download the windows version then the next tool we have to download is node.js so here i'm going to say download node.js then i'm going to come on the node.js website right here click on node.js and then select the lts version lts means long-term support this is basically the most stable version then in order to make it easy to install we are going to go to the pre-built installer and we'll click on download node.js so as i so as i previously said i already have this downloaded but all you need to do is to download this open it and follow the instructions in the installer this is very easy so we don't really need to spend too much time showing you it is very easy to download and install just click on download you open it and then hit next and save the folder where you want it to be saved on your pc and you're good to go so i already have it installed so no need for me to install it i'm just showing you here all the tools you need then the next tool we need is then the next tool we need to download and install is mongodb so we are going to do this right now so i'm going to go back to google i'll write download mongodb and then this one is not very straightforward to download so what we're going to do is that we're going to come to the mongodb website and then you scroll down and select the version for your pc so since we are on windows we select windows here and then same thing as i said before we click on download so I'm going to click on download and then download it onto my PC. And for this one, I'm going to show you some extra steps to install it. So once you open your downloaded file, you click on next. Then I already have it installed. So, so once you have MongoDB downloaded, you click on it in order to install. Then you click on next. You accept the terms. You click on next. And then here you select complete. So you want to install the complete version. And this is something very important to do. Make sure to leave this selected and then you can leave it to install on the default directory that the program chooses to install on. Then you click on next 
and then later on you also have to leave this selected because we want to install mongodb compass because this is basically a front-end interface for you to interact with your database and then finally you click on install and you should see a pop-up after this pop-up comes you click on yes and then just wait for it to install so this is mongodb compass this is basically what we are going to use to view our database so our collections our documents and our actual fields that we create back in our backend so now that we have everything installed let's go ahead and test to see if mongodb is running correctly so in order to do this we'll go ahead and close mongodb compass so we're going to launch our windows using the windows key then we're going to type in the command prompt then in the command prompt we are going to type sc query and then here we'll say mongodb and then this is what you should have here running this shows that the service mongodb is running and you actually have a database installed locally to your device so we can start using this database to build our actual applications so so this is the very first step done that is installing the necessary tools and then now we can move over to the next step so for the next step we are going to go ahead and open visual studio code that is the first software you downloaded and installed now you have to open it because that is what we're going to be using to be working throughout this lesson so head over to windows open vs code and then this is what should show up so let me expand it so you can see what's going on really well and now i'm going to increase the size of the text so it can be easy to read so this is visual studio code so in visual studio code here is a quick start menu where you can create a new file, open a file, open a folder, clone a git repository and all this cool stuff. And here is where you see the recent project you recently worked on. So what we are going to do now is that we are going to create a new folder. And since I'm working directly on my desktop, I like creating folders on my desktop. So what I'm going to do is that I'll right click here and then go to new, go to folder and I'll create my new folder. I'll call it student management app so we have our new folder created you can create this folder anywhere and in order to open this folder there are two ways if you create it on the desktop like me you can just drag and drop it here or you can come here to open folder you click on open folder and browse through the folders in your pc and open that folder directly to vs code so i'll just drag and drop mine right here so now that we have our folder opened, the next thing we need to do is to create our necessary folders for our program. So since this is a full stack application, our application will consist of three main parts. That is the front end section, the back end section and the database. For the database, we are going to use MongoDB. So we already have MongoDB installed and MongoDB compass that we're going to use to see our data. But for the front end and the back end, we have to create that one from scratch and actually start writing code. And that is where the fun part begins, that is in writing our code. So first things first, let's create our folders. We'll create a first folder called front end. So this icon right here is for creating a new file. This other icon here is for creating a new folder. So here we're going to create a new folder. We're going to call it front end. And then next we're going to create another folder and we are going to call this folder back end. And now we have our two folders created and front end is going to contain all our code for our front end side. That is the side that the user is going to see and interact with. And then the back end is going to contain all the business logic of the application. That is the back end will contain our API endpoints. So everything that will help us add students, delete students, uh, update students data and so on. I always recommend starting with the backend when you're building your full stack application because the backend helps you lay down how data is going to be organized and how data is going to be accessed throughout your application. Because if you start just with your front end, you're going to have to enter a lot of static data which can really hinder you in creating a very good schema at the end of the day. So starting with the backend will help you create the necessary schemas, will help you create the necessary endpoint so that you can just end up creating your front end with all the data already available for you. So let's get started with the backend. So in order to get started, the first thing we are going to do is we are going to come up here 
and then we're going to open a new terminal. So if you have a bigger screen, you might be able to see the terminal tab directly here, but mine is hidden here. That's why I have to click on this button and open a new terminal. So I have the terminal here. The next thing I have to do is I have to navigate to the directory of my backend. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to type CD backend. This is now going to help me access my backend so I can now install my necessary files to my backend and also run the necessary commands. So in order to navigate to the backend, you use CD backend, which means change direction to the backend. So now that I'm in my backend folder, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to type the command npm init and then negative y. So this npm is from the Node.js we installed previously. So always, so make so if you haven't installed Node.js yet, make sure to install Node.js. So I'm going to type npm init negative y. So if I open my backend, I see that it has created a package.json file. And if you open this package.json, it contains information for us to get started with our backend. Now, the next thing we're going to do is we are going to install the necessary packages for us to be able to build applications with the backend. So the first thing we will install here is Express. So we're going to basically install five different packages. So the first one is Express. Express is what is going to help us build API endpoints. That is what we're going to use to establish a communication between the front end and the back end. Then we're going to install Mongoose. Mongoose is basically what is going to help us access our MongoDB backend and use different functions that are going to help us store data into our MongoDB backend. And this course will allow your web application to safely handle requests from different origins, that is, domains, protocols, or ports. The next thing we're going to install here is .env. This .env will help us create a secure environment so we can put necessary string of text so that we shouldn't have to commit them to our repository once we want to share the changes to GitHub or something like that. The next thing we are going to install here is Axios. And for this particular application, we are not going to use Axios, but in case we want to use Axios, Axios is going to help us easily fetch data from external APIs. And finally, we are going to install Notebun. So Notebun is a utility that automatically restarts your Node.js application when it detects any file changes in the directory. So in order to install all these, you need to write each of them separated with a space and then end up pressing the enter key. Okay, as we see, we have an error and this error is just because I didn't write the install key or I didn't write the install keyword. So now that I've written npm install express mongoose course.env axios and nodemon, when I press enter, it should take a while, it'll just take a few minutes or a few seconds and install everything. So everything is done installing, we see that this is everything we just installed and it created a new folder called node modules. This node modules actually contains the data and the code for all these packages we just installed. Now, the next thing we need to do is to create a file that is going to contain all our code which we will use to run our backend. So we come over to the backend here, we right click, we come on new file, and then we write server.js. This is Node.js, and remember that Node.js is JavaScript, so the extension has to be JS. Server.js, we can now start writing our code. So since the code for this application is quite lengthy, I'm not going to be typing every single thing for this code. We are just going to be inserting all the lines of code so you can see how the application comes together. Remember that you're not going to learn how to build a complete application like this from scratch in a day. It takes practice and dedication to reach to a level where you can actually build this by yourself. So this is going to help you understand how we do to build these applications, see the possibilities, and ultimately get you started with your coding journey so you can learn all this from scratch, understand how they work, and build your own application. So the first thing we are going to do is to import our necessary packages that we're going to use throughout this, our backend. So the first one we're going to use is Express. So we're going to start by defining a constant called Express and then attribute this value to it. This is basically calling the Express package we just installed and giving it to this constant right here. We're going to do the same thing for Mongoose. We'll do the same thing for Course. Okay, before we start writing our lines of code, we are also going to install two different packages that are going to make our work easier. And the first package is called Winston. So we're going to use npm install 
Winston and we are also going to install Morgan. So these two packages is going to help us log each of our requests onto our terminal. So each time there is a request from the front end, we can actually see the actual request in the back end and validate to see if our requests are working well. So we are just going to install it and we'll be implementing it as we go. So now that we've created our server.js and installed our necessary packages, we are going to start adding in our code step by step and explaining what is going on. So the first thing I want to do here is to define the packages that we are going to use. So firstly, we are going to say const express and then we'll require express. So this require express here basically imports the express.js framework from node modules. So this is the same thing for the mongoose, the course, and all of these other things that have this required keyword. It's importing each of these packages and each of these frameworks onto our application so we can actually access it and use it throughout. So now the next thing we're going to do is to define our core application. So here we are going to say const app equals to express, basically calling the express object. This will allow us to access all the methods, all the functions from this package. Next, we have to define our middleware. And our middleware are going to be things like the course. So we're going to say app.use course. And then next, we are going to say app.use express.json. And then next, we are going to say app.use. And then next, we are going to say app.use express.static public. So this line tells Express to serve static files like images, CSS, and JavaScript from a directory named public. It's like creating a direct path to your static object. So we don't really need this for the sake of this application, but generally you're going to need it when you're going to be writing your own backends. So we're just going to leave it there. So next we need to establish the MongoDB connection. And for this, I'm going to go ahead and paste the code we need for the MongoDB connection. And here in this mongoose.connect, remember that we just defined the mongoose constant that requires the mongoose package. So from this, we have access to the connect method, which helps us establish the connection with our mongoDB. And here we see that we're accessing a variable called process.nv.mongodbURI, which is supposed to be stored inside our process.mv file. And now we have to create our .env file. What we have to do here is to come over here to new file and then write .env. And now this will help us write our sensitive data like our ports, our API keys, and so on. So we're going to copy what we have here, and then we're going to paste here. So this is the MongoDB URI, which is the default URI that our database is going to be running on. And it's going to be running on the port 3000. So, this, so all of this function here will help us establish a secured connection with our database. Now the next thing we're going to do here is we're going to define our logger. And this logger is the Winston logger. So in order to define this, we are going to create a new variable called logger, and then we are going to use this Winston in order to create this logger. So you don't need to understand how this works. This is found in the Winston documentation. So once you're going to get more accustomed with coding and reading documentation, you'll be able to head over to other documentations and see how packages like this are being used in order to build your own application. But the reason we are establishing this is to have a valid login throughout our application. So anytime there is an API request or an API call to our backend, we should be able to see it logged throughout our application. So all what we have done so far yet, we have not yet started actually coding the API endpoints to store, update, delete students and courses. We are doing this right now in order to make our backend more accessible for developers and for you yourself as a full stack developer to use. So the next thing we're going to do is we are going to define the login middleware for our complete logs in our backend. So we're going to add this line of code in order to do that. Then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to define a custom API logger for our middleware. So we're going to basically be defining the fields for our different information inside our logs. So let's do it here by adding this piece of code. So all of this right here is what is going to show once we are going to be logging the data onto our terminal. We're going to be having the method that is being used, the path, the status, the params, the query, and so on. So once we are going to start running our backend, you see how all this is working. 
I remember that this app is an instance of our express that we defined up here. So here we use the app.use API logger to tell our app that it's actually going to be using this API logger somewhere in our application. Then next we also have to define an error handling middleware. So we're going to do something similar to this API logger here and this is the code we will add for the error handling. So if there is an error in our application, if there is an error in our API call, we should be able to see it inside our error logger and it's going to come as and the error is going to come in the form of a red color to show you that there's an error and you should probably address it via maybe your backend or via sending a right API call or via properly using the API in your front end. Now we can go straight into defining the schemas for our student data. So first what we're going to do here is that we're going to create a constant called student schema and then in this schema we're going to say new mongo schema. This is basically going to create a new schema in our MongoDB database. And if you don't know what a schema is, in MongoDB, a schema is typically used with Mongoose in Node.js as we are using Mongoose right here to define the schema. And it's like a blueprint that defines the structure and rules for your documents in a collection. So let us go ahead and define this schema. Firstly, in our schema, we're going to have a name and this name is going to have type string. And if you don't know what a string is, a string is just a series of characters. And then the required here is going to be true. It means that a student must have a name. And then the next schema we will have here is the email. For the email is going to be similar. The type is going to be string. Required is going to be true. And then we'll add another variable called unique. And unique is going to be said to be true. Because two students cannot have the same email. Or two people cannot even have the same email. Then we are going to set another field for course. And then for the course, the type here is going to be string because remember that the course takes the ID of the course you're going to create and required is going to be true because every student has to be registered to a course. And we're going to just copy and paste the next two fields we're going to have inside our database. So the next two is enrollment date and we have the type here date and then required is true and we have status, the type is string and then required is enum. And if you don't know what enum is, it's basically a property that specifies a list of allowed values for a field. So for this particular field, the only allowed values here are active and inactive. If any other value is entered in this field, or if any other value is passed in the database, it is going to fail. It's going to refuse to accept the value that is incoming. So the only values acceptable in the status field is active or inactive. And then we can set the default here to active. And finally here, we can now have a timestamp. So for the timestamp here, it's going to be set to true to say that we should have a timestamp when the data is being entered to the database. So this is it right here. This is the schema for the student. So this is all the data for the student that is going to be entered in the database. So we have the name, the email, the course, enrollment date, status, and the timestamps. So finally, we are going to enter a very important line. And this line is going to be crucial for creating a model from your schema in Mongoose. And the object we are going to create here is what is going to be used to access all the different functions that we will use to uh, create data for the students, update the data, delete, and so on. So we're going to say con student. And then this student here is the collection name in your MongoDB database. And the student schema here refers to the student schema we just created right here. So now that we have the schema created for our students, we have to create a schema for our courses. So the next thing we will do here is we'll go to const, we'll create the course schema. So we have here course schema right here. And then it's going to be equals to new mongoose.schema. And then inside the schema here, similar to what we had in the students, we're going to have the course name and in our course name, that we're going to have a type of string and then unique is going to be true because in a school, you cannot have two courses with the same name. So course name has to be unique. And then we're going to have description. <clears throat> we're going to give a course description. We're going to give the type here of string and then required true. We also have the duration because we want to know how long a course is going to last for. 
So there are some courses that last for one year, others four years, other 12 months, and so on. So the type here is going to be number required. It's also going to be true. And then now we're going to have status. For the status, we're going to have type, string, and then enum, active and inactive. And the default value here is going to be active. And finally, we're going to give it a timestamp. So we say timestamp true. And similarly to what we did for the students, we have to define the model for our course. So we're going to say const course equals to mongoose.model. And then here, we'll define a course collection and give the course schema right here that we just created. Now, the next part is the most interesting part, which is our API routes. So we have to start by creating the routes for our courses. So here we're going to say course routes, and this is what will allow us to interact with our backend directly from our front end. And this get right here is what they call an HTTP request. There are, there are several types of HTTP requests. You have the get, you have the update, you have the put, you have the delete, you have the post. So the get as the name suggests is used to get data or retrieve data. So now we're going to create an API endpoint using this get request. So here we're going to have API slash courses slash courses and this is going to help us get all the courses available in our database and now here we're going to create an async function this is going to be the request and then the response and now we can have an arrow function here and here we're going to have a try catch block so now since this lesson is not about us writing every single line i'm going to copy what we have and paste here and then explain what is going on so here we're going to have what is called a try catch block so this try block here is being executed first and this catch is used to catch any errors that arises when trying to run this code. So this line right here helps us retrieve the course from our database and then sort it in ascending order. So it helps us retrieve the courses in our database and sorting them in ascending order. So this basically tells us to start from the first letter in the alphabet up to the last so if the first course starts with let's say a let's say it's accounting that is going to be the first course that is retrieved from the database and it's going to retrieve all the courses in alphabetical order up to the last this is basically what we are getting from this api endpoint we are retrieving all the courses and this catch here is used to catch any errors that arise and logs it onto our terminal. This logger right here is very useful as if we are successfully able to fetch courses, it's going to tell us that we have retrieved this amount of courses successfully. So next, let's create the next API endpoint. This next API endpoint is called a post request. This post request helps us send data onto our API. And in this post request, what we are going to be doing is that we are going to use to send the data in order to create a new course and the new course if we look at this our uh, course schema a new course contains a name description duration status so what is going to be happening here is that we're, we are going to be sending a request from our front end and we'll basically get this request and get the request body and pass it inside this object and this object is going to basically contain all the data for our course which includes the name the description um, the status and so on and now we're going to use this variable right here in order to save the course. And we're going to use the course.save function in order to save it right here. And once we save the course, we will log it onto our terminal so we can actually see that the course has, was successfully created. And then we're going to return the status here saying that the course was saved. And obviously here we have to have a catch block so that if there is any error that arises, it shouldn't crash our entire backend and it should instead handle the error and send over the message over to our terminal. So if there is a developer available, the developer can check and solve any error. And it's even good since you're a full stack developer, you can automatically check this error and resolve it by yourself. Next, we are going to create an endpoint for updating a course. So this endpoint here is used to update a course. So similarly to what we have previously to create a course, we also have an endpoint to update a course. So once we click on the edit button on a particular course, we are basically getting the course ID and passing it here to this API and getting all the data that corresponds to that course with that particular ID. 
and loading in that data and now allowing us to edit that data and then store back the edited data to the database. So this is what this endpoint here is for. And finally, we need the final endpoint for the courses, which is the delayed endpoint. So here is our delayed endpoint. So this delayed API endpoint first checks if there are any students enrolled in any course. If yes, it attempts to delay the course by its ID and sends appropriate responses. It first sends the success, it first sends the success with code 200 or it can send the not found with code 404 and then it can send the can't delete with code 400 to tell us that we cannot delete that course or it can even send an error that is if a that is if an error occurs that it doesn't really know about it's going to send a code of 500. This route also includes logging for tracking the deletion process and error handling throughout this try catch block. So all these loggers that we see here will help us actually log in the data and tell us that we have successfully deleted a course when we do. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to create the final endpoint for the course, which is to get a single course by ID. So remember that we had an endpoint which was used to get all the courses, but this one will be used to get a single course. Next, we have to create now the different endpoints for the student route. So the first endpoint similar to what we had for the course is to get all of the students. So we're going to have here API slash students. And in this API slash student here, what we're doing is basically similar to what we had for the courses. We are getting all the students in, in order of when they were created. So we are sorting them according to when they were created. So the first student created will be at the top and the second student created will be at the next level and the last student created will be at the last position. So this get API endpoint retrieves all students from the database sorted by creation date in descending order. And negative one means the newest first. So when it's successful, it returns a student as a JSON with a 200 status. And if there's an error, it returns a 500 status with the error message. And obviously this endpoint logs and tracks successful retrievers and any errors. The next API endpoint is going to be the post API endpoint, which creates a new student in the database using the data sent in the request body. So basically the data that is being sent from the front end is going to be used in the back end from this request body in order to pass it onto our object and then use this data to create our new students. It will save the student's details, log the successful creation with student information and return the saved student with a 201 status. That is, if it has been successfully created. And then next we are going to have an endpoint to modify our student. So I'm not going to explain this one because it's basically similar to what we had in modifying the courses. So enter the student ID here and then retrieve the data and we can update the student data using this. Next, we are going to also have the endpoint to delete our student. So this is going to be app.delete and will help us delete a specific student similar as we did to the courses. And then now we're going to have an endpoint used to search for a student. So this is going to be using the app.get and then this is going to use the api.search slash search. And this is going to use the API slash student slash search endpoint. So this will basically help us find a student according to their name, the courses in which they are registered or their email. This is actually a very powerful function that will help us search throughout our database to find the right students we are looking for. And then for our student dashboard, we'll have a final endpoint. And this endpoint will help us aggregate all the data that we have stored. So this is going to be a dashboard stat. And then this will be calling the get dashboard stats, which will create just right now. This get dashboard stats is going to be an asynchronous function that will help us retrieve the total students, the active students, total courses, sorry, active courses, graduate and course counts. And it also help us retrieve the success rate. So this last success rate is going to be if we want to expand on this application and add also graduates, add also several other data, we'll use this success rate in order to count the number of students who graduated and see the percentage of students who have actually succeeded. So this is what this dashboard stats API endpoint is going to do. 
it will help us aggregate all this data and be able to retrieve the total of each of the tables we are going to have. And now finally, I'm going to add two endpoints in order for us to check if our data and now I'm going to add two endpoints to actually check if our backend is running successfully. So I'm not going to explain every single thing that is going on there, but I'm just going to add it so once we run our backend, we can check if they are actually running. So the name of the endpoint is called health. And this health endpoint will be used to check if our backend is running and if everything works well. So we can also have a detailed health here to actually check if everything is working well before we proceed to calling our endpoint in our front end. Finally, let's add this endpoint as we added this similar endpoint to our courses, but we didn't add to our students. That is just to get a single student by their ID. Now the final, now we're going to add the final function that is going to help us format the uptime of our application. So this is it here. It's just some mathematical calculations to in order to format our uptime. And then now we have to be able to start our server. So in order to start the server, we're going to say const port equals to process.env.port. And this process.env.port here basically access this port right here, which is in the .env file, which is port 3000. Or we can add the 3000 here to say that if it's not able to access the .env file for some reason, it should come and access it using this value. So it should come and access this, direct, this value directly. These two uh, straight slashes right here are to say or so either access this or this so next we are going to start our server we'll say app dot listen so we are basically telling it to listen to this port and listen to any changes right here here we're going to have an arrow function and here we're going to say console.log server is running on port this so basically port 3000 so in order to see if this is working, let's go ahead and run our application. So to run our application, we are going to say node and then our application name, which is server.js. So here we're going to say node server.js. And then we should see everything running right here. We, see, we have some warnings here. Uh, we can go ahead and ignore this warning, but these are the two main things that we want to see. So it says server is running on port 3000 and we, it says it is connected to MongoDB. So our backend is officially running and now we can start testing our endpoints. So this is one major part of your application which is already running and you can see the number of lines of code that we had done to achieve all this. So obviously you can always have a fewer number of lines of code in your application depending on the complexity of the application you're trying to build or you can even have more lines of code. There are even applications who have up to um, even like a hundred thousand lines of code but this is a relatively small application so we only have 400 lines of code for all these endpoints and all these functions we just created. So let's go ahead and test if this backend is actually working. So I'm going to pull up my browser right now. I'm just going to put it right next to our backend so you can see what's happening here. Okay, so we can see right what is happening here. Our, our backend is basically running on port 3000. So in order to call it, we're going to say HTTP. Then we're going to have here localhost. And then since it's running on port 3000, we're going to say here 3000 slash health. Because remember that we defined an endpoint called health, which is going to check if our database and our endpoints are working correctly. So if we click on enter, see that we first of all have a log that is being logged directly in our terminal to show that we have actually interacted with our backend via our website or our web browser. So this is the first part of our full stack application that is already done. Our backend is running and we are able to access this backend via an API endpoint on our browser. So this is it happening in real time here. So we have the status which says up. So uh, our server is actually up and we have the timestamp which gives the current time and then the uptime which says for how long the backend has been running. And the environment is development. Development means that work is still in progress. You have not yet pushed it to the public for the public to start using. It's still in development. So we can also see a detailed health. So if we go down right here, let's go down to our endpoint we had on the health. So we have the health detailed. So we have here health detailed. 
We can also see some detailed login or some detailed information about the health of our application. It means our application is up and running. It's connected. It's connected. The backend is connected to MongoDB. Uh, we have the memory which is running right now and everything works fine. This is our logs that are being logged anytime an API call is made to our backend. So we can actually see in real time how many API calls are, are being done. So now the next thing we are going to do is all these API endpoints we just created right now, we are going to be able to see them on the front end. But before that, let's go ahead and change the name of our application. I'm going to say student management app here, just because I already have a database called student management back in my MongoDB. And just to differentiate, I'm going to add app right here. So let's also go and do it um, on the first section here. Let's go and change it right here. Let's call it student management app. So we don't need to do any other change. Those two changes are okay. So now let's run our backend one more time. So we have server is running on port 3000. Let's still go ahead and test it. Let's rerun the health. So we actually have some information logged here. Let's rerun this again. We are having our backend up and running. Now the next thing we need to do now is to open MongoDB Compass because we have to make sure our backend is running and our database is also running. So this is MongoDB Compass here. So what you're going to do on your end is that you're going to create a new connection. I already have a new connection already set up. So what you do is that you create a new connection and you give the connection a name. So once you give it a name, you click on connect and it's going to connect to your database. I have my own connection already established and I named it weather app. So this basically contains all the different databases that I have on my PC. So I have a, a database for my weather app. This is the first student management I created and this is the second. So if I click on it here, we see that we have two collections already created. And the first collection here is the courses collection, which contains no data. The second collection is the student's collection. And we created it thanks to this. So this is the course collection we created here, or the course model, and this is for the students. So you see that once we create it directly in our code, it comes over and creates a new database collection for us to be able to use right here. So we already have everything set up for our back end. Now we need to set up our front end and consume all this API data and also be able to display all the data directly to our front end. Now let's get straight to the second part. Okay, now heading over to the front end part, we are going to create a new file. And this new file is going to be called index.html. So for the sake of this lesson and trying to keep everything as simple as possible, we are going to put everything inside a single file. But ideally, you want to separate your CSS, your JavaScript, and your HTML into different files. But here, we'll create everything in a single file in order to keep everything simple and not to really complicate our lives. So the first thing we're going to do here is we are going to add the exclamation mark and type enter. This is going to help us create a boilerplate code in order to get started with our application. So here we're going to add the title of our web page, which is going to be Students Management Dashboard. And then next, we're going to be using some icons from a website called Fonts Awesome Icons. So in order to get this link, you can get it directly on their website, or you can access it from the project files of this lesson. So this is basically the fonts that we're going to be using. This is the link to all those fonts. And now the next thing we are going to do is we'll start by defining our HTML. But first, let us go ahead and run our website to look at the changes in real time. So in order to open it, you right click and click on open with live server. But in order to do this, you have to have live server extension installed. So to do this, we we'll have to go to extensions, type live server, and then install it. I already have mine installed, obviously, so I'm not going to reinstall it. but if you don't have it installed, go ahead and click on the install button and wait for it to install. When you have it installed now, you right click and click on open with live server. Now our front end site is opened. I'll just go ahead and minimize this and then open our website side by side so we can have our front end open on one end and our website open on the other end so we can be seeing what we are 
uh, modifying in real time. I'm going to click on Alt Z right here to put everything on the same page. So similar to what we were doing on the back end, we are not going to write every single line of code line by line. We are going to write the lines of code in blocks and I'm going to explain what is going on because the whole purpose of this is for you to understand how all this works and how these come together and for it to possibly enlighten you on how to build your own applications. So the first thing we are going to create is we are going to create a div and this div is going to contain a class called container. And then inside this first div, we are going to have our sidebar logo. So let's first of all start by adding a comment. And this first comment will tell us that this is our sidebar. So in this our sidebar now, we are going to have another div here. And the class name is going to be sidebar. And in this sidebar now, because remember, when you have a dashboard, you have like a sidebar that spans across the left of your uh, web page and then you have the content which is on the right so we have to have a div that is going to contain all of the other tabs in our sidebar that is why we are setting everything inside this sidebar div so the first thing that our sidebar is going to have is the logo so for the logo we're going to have the class called logo and then inside this logo we are going to have an icon with class name FAS which stands for font awesome FA graduation cap. So let me just go ahead and write it real quick. And this is basically the icon that has come up here. And the name that we're going to put right beside this icon is Edu Manager. So it basically stands for Educational Manager. So this is our logo that we have created right here. So now the next things we are going to do similar to this one is we are going to have several different options right here. I'm just going to copy all of them and paste yes so we shouldn't make this too lengthy. Okay, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to have our div. We'll have a next div and then for the class name, we're going to have nav, nav item and then we're going to set this to active and then we're going to have here data section and then we'll set it to dashboard and then here we are going to have uh, <clears throat> we'll set this here to dashboard here we're going to have an icon right here with the class name FAS FA chart and then pi and then now just below this is going to be the name dashboard so this is basically how we're going to be doing to add our dashboard elements so what I'm going to do now is just that I'm just going to copy this and then paste it several times for our different dashboard elements. Now this is all about our HTML for our sidebar. Now for the next part, we're going to have the HTML for our main content. So I'm going to add in our different divs. So for this section, I'm going to add in our different div. And the first thing we're going to get started with is to add the main div. And this main div will contain everything in our main section. This class is going to be called main content. And remember that all of these classes is what we are going to use in our CSS in order to style all of our HTML. Now let us add a header. This header is going to basically contain the navigation menu, which is not actually going to be a menu, but it's just going to be a navigation bar with the search button. As you can see, we have search students here and we have the admin name right here. Now, just below this header section, we are going to now have the dashboard section. And similarly to what we did above, we will copy everything and just paste so we shouldn't type every single thing. I remember that the code to this application is available on our repository. So this is what we have here. So this dashboard is going to have the total students, the active students, the graduates, and the success rate. So these different class names right here are what we're going to use to style it and give it a very nice shape and something that actually makes sense for us to visualize our data. So this is everything that is going to be on our dashboard section. And then after this, we are going to have our list of students. So we're going to add another comment here, which is going to say students list. Students list in dashboard. And then now we are going to copy our students list, which is going to contain a bunch of tables. And as you can see here, here is the main div that contains the students list. 
this is the button that is going to be used to add a student and once we click on this button it's going to call this open modal function which we are going to define in our javascript and then below this button we have now our table and this table contains the student id the name the course uh, enrollment date status actions and inside this student header we are going to have the student body and the body is going to be populated dynamically thanks to javascript i remember that javascript thanks to javascript we can modify the dom dy dynamically so once we click on add student it's going to add the student to the database send back a response to the front end which will be used to display the data onto our front end so right now we don't have any student added to our database so there is no data running right here and we have no way of retrieving the data because we haven't even actually written every, any javascript for that so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add a student section because remember that we are having our sidebar which contains several sections so here we're going to have the student section and this student section will just contain the table we just created. So this student section still just contains this same thing we just added above. And then now we are going to have the course section. So the course section will be similar to the student section, just that is going to be for the courses. So we are going to give it different IDs, different class names, um, and so on. And also a different function to open the course model. But the table header is going to be similar which will contain the id the name description and so on as you can see these are the table headers right here the different buttons to add students and to add courses and now we are going to add a report section the report section is just going to be a dummy section because we haven't actually created any significant data for the reports and the settings but we are just going to add it so that when we want to navigate to the report tab or the settings tab we should be able to see them there and then finally, we are going to add in HTML for our different models that we are going to be using throughout our program. So here, here is going to be the student model. So anytime we want to edit a student, this model is going to pop up. So once we click on the edit button, this model is going to pop up and we are going to be able to edit the student there. Even for the add student function, once we want to add the students, we click on the add button, it will pop up this model so we can actually add the student's data. And as you can see, there is an on click attribute right here, which will help us call the function to close the model. We'll also be able to submit the data using uh, this submit form right here or this submit button right here, which will help us store the data in the database. And these are actually all the fields that we are going to use in order to do this. So this select course will pull up all the courses that are being stored in the database. And this full name will help us enter all the names and will basically be able to enter all the data for the students. So we have to do the same thing to delete a student. So we have to add a delete confirmation model. So we're going to add a delete confirmation model. So as you can see, here is the comment here, delete confirmation. And now here are all the different deeds for the delete confirmation. And then the different statements which ask if you're sure that you want to delete this item. And this item cannot be undone once it is done. And then finally, the final model we are going to have is for the course model. So in order for us to add a course, edit a course, and also modify a course. So this is the course model similar to the student model we have the different things we can add to the course like the name uh, the description the duration the status and we can finally submit it to the database and do the necessary processes in our backend and retrieve the response and display our course so this is everything in our html and as you can see it doesn't really look good when you have not yet added any css or any javascript to your application this is basically how it is. It is very bland, just a bunch of text, a bunch of uh, input fields, buttons that really don't make any sense. But you need to add your HTML as your HTML is the skeleton of your website. Without HTML, any other thing cannot be seen on the web page. It's just like in the human body, there are the bones before there is the skin that makes us beautiful and all our other attributes. But there is first the bones. The bones are not really pretty but that is what keeps us moving that is what keeps us alive so html is actually the backbone 
though it doesn't look like any website you know it is actually what holds every website you know so the next thing before we actually head over to um, adding our CSS is to add our loading spinner so this this loading spinner is just our loading indicator that is going to tell us that our uh, APIs are actually fetching so we're going to add it right here so this is everything we've added right here for the sake of this lesson we are not going to enter every single CSS code we're just going to copy the CSS code we have and paste it and as I said the code is available in our repository so you can always copy and paste it in order to run it by yourself so once we are going to copy and paste our style here you will see how this will basically transform into a fully fleshed website so the styles are going over to the head of your application so this is where the head starts and this is where it ends so what you want to do is that you want to add the style right here just before the end of the head so now for the style we are going to copy all the styles we have and we're going to paste it here and you can see that this has literally transformed our application Obviously, when you're building your own application from, from scratch, you're not magically going to copy CSS from somewhere and paste it onto your application. You have to write the CSS manually. And once you enroll to the Programmers University, we basically teach you all what these properties are for, how they work, how you can combine them to achieve very interesting layouts as we have here. So this is the dashboard we just created. Right now, we cannot yet navigate between uh, different elements in our dashboard just because we have to write a navigation function in our JavaScript. But you can already see how this actually looks good. All the buttons that were looking ugly now look good. And then here is the admin, here is the search button, and here is everything we have for our application. But now, this application doesn't really do much because it is just some static text and it doesn't really have anything much going on to it. Where the real magic happens now is in the JavaScript because JavaScript helps us dynamically add data, add elements, add several things onto our application that you cannot do just with HTML and CSS. So CSS will help beautify your website, HTML will help establish the backbone of your website and JavaScript will help build in the functionality. Now let's head over and add the functionality using JavaScript. So in order to do this, we are going to go at the very bottom just before our body ends and we are going to add two tags called scripts. So we are going to open and close the script and that is where we will be adding all our JavaScript in our application. And this is now where we are going to be able to consume all our APIs, um, store, retrieve data and so on. So the first thing we have to do is we have to define the global state and constant. So firstly, we first have to define our API endpoints. Remember that in our backend that we just created, this is our backend that is still running. We have our API endpoint which says that the server is running on port 3000. So we have to define this base URL here, which is running on the local host 3000. So this is basically where we're going to be accessing our API because it's running locally. But if we were to host this our backend, but if we were to host this our backend and we have a valid official URL, we'll be able to use that URL in our application. But now everything is running locally, even our database. So we are using this local endpoint called localhost 3000, called localhost running on port 3000. So the next thing we're going to do is we are going to declare our different variables. The variables we'll have, we'll have an array of students, an array of courses, a current section which is going to be current section and the default section will be the dashboard so basically the current section that is selected will have editing ID editing course ID to check which students we are editing or which course we are editing we'll have a delete type variable to check whether we are deleting a student or a course and finally a deleted ID to check if data is deleted or not because if it is not deleted we should keep it on the dashboard but if it is we should remove it from our table then next we have to define our dom elements so for the dom elements we are basically going to be getting the ids from all of the html we defined right here so let me go ahead and just add it right here so firstly we have const student table body so the student table body is gotten from this student table right here if we tap ctrl d and we see where it was we see that this id belongs to 
this table body right here for the students. As you can see, this is where the data for the students will be populated dynamically. And we have to get the data directly in our JavaScript. So we say const student table body equals to document dot get element by ID, because this now becomes a reference to this ID of this student table body uh, added in our HTML. So that once we add the students, it knows that it is going to come and add in straight here. Without this ID, JavaScript will have no way to know where to place this. But thanks to this ID, JavaScript knows that. Once you add the students, it has to come and place it directly in this location. So this is what is happening here. And all of these other constants here basically does the same thing. It's basically a reference to the different IDs that we have in our HTML code. So if you click on this and press Ctrl D, you see that we have defined the different IDs all over our HTML code here. The same with the course table body, the student model, the course model, the student form, course form, and loading spinner. So this is so that we can have a reference in our JavaScript code so we can go ahead and dynamically modify all those HTML elements inside our HTML code. Now the next thing we are going to do is we are going to initialize our dashboard and we are going to do this thanks to what is called an events listener and we'll be listening to if the content on the DOM is loaded and if it is loaded we'll call the initialize events listener functions which we are going to create. And also we are going to call the check and load data function, which we are also going to create in a minute. And all of these are going to be in an arrow function, which is going to be an asynchronous function. So let's go ahead and create our initialize events listeners function. So this is our initialize events listener function that we'll add here. <clears throat> so this function actually initializes all our events listeners. So starting with the student form. So the student form listens to the events submit. So if anybody clicks on the save button, it calls this function handle form submit and then uh, listens to this submit event and then submits it onto our uh, backend. And our backend can do its process like either updating, adding or deleting. The same for the course form. Also for the search input, it listens to the input event and then calls this function. And then for the navigation, we have the document.query selector all nav item because we have several items with the nav item class and it's basically selecting all of these items so we can navigate through each section. So once we are done with this, we'll be able to navigate through each section in the database. And then finally, once a modal is up, like if we bring up the modal to delete a student or to update a student, if we click anywhere outside the modal, we are going to be able to close that modal. So this is what this is for, this window dot. And then next, we are going to have to initialize data load and checks. We will do it thanks to this function. So once we load the page, we have to check if the data is available in the database, load it and check if the data is correct before displaying it over here. So here it is. We have the async function check and load data. So it has to first of all show the loading indicator and then it awaits. We call the load courses, which we are going to create. And then from this, we have to check if any courses is available. If any courses is available, we have to display the courses. If not, it's going to ask us to add courses before managing students because we cannot add a student if there is no course. So this is what this is basically going to do. So this function is basically going to help us navigate throughout the functions. So once we are done adding all these functions, we are going to go ahead and test this application to see if it works. So we have this navigation functions added here, and this basically checks all the class names with the nav item name, and then navigates through all of these items and checks if the current selected item has the active class. If it has the active class, it won't attribute the active class to that item, but if not, it's going to remove that active class from the previous class which had the active class and attribute it to the new one. So this is what this update active nav item actually does. And then once we navigate to the correct one, we have to hide the actual section from it and show the selected section. So this is what this function does. So let's keep adding our functions to add our functionality to our application. Now here, we are going to add the functions to access our API. So this first function is to update the dashboard start. And this is now where we are going to start using the APIs we created in our backend. So starting with the const response equals to await fetch. And this fetch function is used to fetch data from an API. 
this API base URL here, remember that we defined it and gave it the value of HTTP localhost with port 3000, telling our application that it's going to access the local server we created in our backend. So if we go back to this, we see that in order to access the dashboard stats, it is doing so using the API slash dashboard slash stats endpoint that we created in our backend. And if the response is not okay, so if there is an error, it throws a new error saying that fail to fetch. Else if there is no error, it's going to get the stat which is in a JSON format, convert that JSON into an object because JavaScript only understands object and then we can handle that object now and now add the data inside our HTML. So this is everything that is being done here dynamically and now we are able to also and now we are able to also add it onto our courses table the next two functions we are going to add here are the load students functions and the load courses function so these functions here are going to help us load the students data and also load the courses data so this load students here similar to what we had for the dashboard stats accesses the api endpoint students and perform the necessary things with the data so for, so that we can pull in the data from the database. Same thing with this load courses right here. It also accesses the courses API endpoints and checks if we have successfully pulled the data from the database before actually updating the course dropdown and the render course table. Now we need to add the CRUD operations for the students. CRUD basically means create, retrieve, update, and delete which helps us create data in our database, retrieve data from our database, update data, and ultimately delete data. So now we are going to add the different functions to help us perform these different operations on our students. So right here, starting with the create students, we will have create students here, which is going to create the students thanks to this, our API. Remember that all of these things we are doing is just interacting with the backend. So this function interacts with the backend for us to create a student. This other one interacts with the backend for us to update a student. And to update the student, we have to have the student ID. And we get the student ID and parse it to this API so we can know exactly which student we are trying to modify from our database. Same thing with the delete. We get the student ID and thanks to a later function, we'll be able to pass this ID and delete the right student. Next, we have to also do this crude operations for the courses. So similar to what we had for the students, we can create a course thanks to this API endpoint. We can update a course and we can also delete a course. And in order to delete a student or a course, we have to be able to bring up a modal that asks us if we are sure we want to delete. And this is the modal that we are going to bring up here. So this function says close delete modal. So if we click on the close button, it will not delete the students and actually close the modal. But instead, if we want to now click on the confirm delete button, we have to create a function that will actually delete this student or this course. And this is the function. So this function confirms that we want to delete it. And then it says if the delete type is student, we actually fetch the API endpoint and then use the delete method. Because remember that we talked about HTTP request saying that there is a get put post delete. So this will actually go to the database and then delete the actual student from the database. Similar to that, we can also delete the course from this and we are doing this by checking if the delete type is course, going to the course endpoint and then deleting the data from the database. And then we do the necessary catches and handling of errors and we hide the loading state when it's done and close the delete model when it's done. The next thing we are going to do is we are going to add two very important functions which are going to help us handle the different forms to add students, update students, and so on. So this form is going to help us handle the form that is going to pop up once we click on the add student button. So with this form, we are going to be able to get the student's name, handle the data entered in the student's name field, same thing with the email, the course, uh, the enrollment date field. And similarly, we'll have a different function which will do the same thing for the handle course submit. So once we enter all the course data, we should be able to click on the submit button and actually submit it onto our backend and store the data in our database. Now we have to create a function in order for us to render our student table. Because after adding the data, after updating the data, we should be able to render the table 
right here. So this function will help us create HTML element dynamically for us to render the student's table. And as you can see here, this is the HTML inside our JavaScript, which helps us render the student's table. So, so, as you can, so you can see really how JavaScript helps us dynamically add HTML into our already existing HTML. So next, what we are going to do is we are going to update the course dropdown because once we want to add a student, we should be able to add the courses from the courses in our database. So this function will help us so that anytime we add a new course, the course should be added onto our database and retrieved when we want to add a new student. Because to add a new student, we should be able to retrieve the courses already existing so we can attribute a course to a student because a student cannot exist if the student doesn't have a course. So this function is going to help us do that. And then next, we are going to do the render course table similar to what we did for the render student table. So we are going to add the render course table. It's going to be a very similar function to the render student table. So we don't really need to explain it. We are basically going to also be dynamically adding the students, uh, sorry, the courses data onto our HTML. And then now we are going to add the different functions for us to modify the model. So here is the open model function. So once you click on the add student button, this will tell you to add at least one course before adding a student. Or if a course is already added, it's going to open the course model. Then you have the close model function, which will help you obviously close your model and then open course model, help you open the course model if you want to add a new course. And finally, the close course model. So these are the different functions for our models. Then now we are going to add two functions. One is going to be to edit the student. The next is going to be to edit the course. So here we have edit student, which is going to take the ID as a parameter and is going to use this ID in order to parse it in our API endpoint so we can actually get the right students we are trying to edit. Next, we are going to do the same for the edit course, taking the ID also as a parameter and then now using this ID to pass it to our API endpoint that we created and now check if it has a valid response. If it does have a valid response, we can go ahead and use the data gotten from it. If not, it's going to throw an error. And then the next thing we are going to implement is the search functionality. So this search functionality will help us search for students based on their name or their email. So here we have let's search timeout. So if we take too much time trying to search for a student and not find any student, it should time out the search. So stop searching via our API. And obviously we also have to use the API endpoint called search, which is going to help us um, search for a student in our database. Now we are just going to add some small utility functions like a function to format the date, the to format the date for input to capitalize first letter for the name and so on. So this is the function to format the date. Then we have the function to format the date for input and also to capitalize the first letter for the student's name. And then we're going to also have some other helper functions like the loading state, uh, the, the function to hide the loading state and so on. Then finally, we're going to add a very important function that will help us bring up the modal once we load a student from a database and the student doesn't actually exist. And also thanks to this function, if we are trying to load a student and there is no course in the database, it will tell us that add a course before trying to add a student. So this is going to help us do that. And this is going to be our notification system. So thanks to this notification system, if we reload this page, it tells us that please add courses before managing students. So we cannot actually pull any student from the database because there is no course that has been added. So you see, it already brings up the modal, tells us to add a new course. And now before we can proceed, we have to add a new course. And then we also have now the error handler function to help us handle any errors. And adding this final function is going to be the end of our front end. So we can go ahead now and test our front end. So if we reload this, you see that once we reload this, we go to the dashboard. Once we click on reload, it automatically brings us to the course. So we can actually create a new course or add a new course before adding a student. So let us check if everything is working out correctly. We are going to minimize this so we can have our backend constantly logging data anytime an API call is being made. So once we save a course, 
an API call is made. Once we load data, an API call is made, and we can see the API calls directly from our backend right here. So if we add the course name here, we have computer engineering. We, we give a description, let's say, learn how to code. The duration is 12 months, and then we save the course. We see that there was an API call here. So what has happened here is that we have actually stored data in our database via a request and received a response. And this response is the data that has actually been stored. So everything you see here is the data that is already stored in our database. We can open MongoDB Compass and then come to our student management app right here and then enter the courses, refresh it. And this is the first course we just added, the computer engineering, with the description, learn how to code, duration 12, and active as we see right here. So we can still add another data or we can still add another course. We are going to say, let's say chemistry. For description, we'll say organic chemistry and inorganic chemistry. And then for the duration, it's going to be 12, 24 months. And then we're going to save it. We see that we have an API request that was made here. And then we have our data that has been added to our database. If we reload this, this is the second data added to our database. And we can edit the data, delete the data, or add a new course. So if we click on edit, we see that an API request was made, which helps us load the data from the database. And we can edit it we can change the name from chemistry to chemistry let's just say chemistry subject if we save the course we see that he has updated it to chemistry subject everything else still stays the same except that that was updated and also if we want to delete a course let's come over and add a new course we'll say biology studies we'll change the duration to 12. let's give the description of a study of the human and then we set it to active if we want to delete this, we click on the delete button, a modal pops up. Once we click anywhere else, a modal pops up. If we click on cancel, the modal goes, or if we click on delete, it actually deletes the course. And if we go over to our database, we refresh it, we see that that course doesn't exist. And we can see that the chemistry name here was updated to chemistry subject. So let's go ahead and add biology studies back. Let's say study of the human. And then we change the duration to 36 months and then we save the course if we come over to our database we refresh it we see that here is the biology studies that has been added right here now we have three different courses that have been added let's now head over to our dashboard and we add the students as you can see here the active courses added here we have the total number of courses which is three so now we can come over to our students let's say tony bradley this is my actual email, tonybradpitt at gmail.com. And you can see the different courses that were added and we can pull them directly from the database and list them here. So Tony Bradley is attending the computer engineering course and his enrollment date was, let's say, 21st October 2024. If you save the students, you see that it adds the new students here. You can see our API call that was made to our database. And if you come over to the database, we click on the students. We refresh it we see that tony bradley was added we can go ahead and and you can also see that the total number of students was also refreshed and now we have one student let's add another student let's say uh, i don't know how to pronounce his name but let's just say aga at gmail.com he's studying a different subject let's say chemistry subject enrollment date is the 23rd we save the students we now see that we have two students here. Let's add other students. Uh, let's give this email He's studying biology 18th. We can see add several students. Um, let me try to add another student, zhang at gmail.com. Also studying computer engineering, the date 2nd October 2024, and we save the students. Now we have four students. So you can, if there was actually a software that was used by a school, the school can add as many students as they want. They can even have up to a hundred thousand students and this database will handle it very smoothly. As you can see, this is all the data in the database. The data looks very primitive in the database, but we make it look 
beautiful in the front end for users to use because if you were to sell this you are not you are not going to show this database to your client what the client wants to see is everything that is just working on the front end so that's why we take our time to really make the front end look good and attractive for users and now you can also delete a student if you click on the delete button here you delete the student if you don't want to delete you can cancel but if you want you delete and it removes the student from the table if you update the database it actually removes the student from the database too and decrement this number from four to three so now there are only three students in the database and now we can navigate throughout our dashboard see the different courses the different students our reports we have our login here so that when any api call is made we can see the api call directly in our terminal and our application is fully built so you've seen how to build a full stack application from start to finish so by now you should have a general idea on how a complete application is built from scratch and this application can be sold to even a school you can also modify this application so that a rental management company can also use it or a real estate company can use it to manage their tenants and there are several more things you can build as a full stack developer so even this application we also expanded it to have a different design so let me just go ahead and show you real quick we also expanded this application to have a different design so this is a different design of this same application as you can see it's accessing the same dashboard it's accessing the same database it just has a different design so this is the diff design we just built right now and this is the different design you see it's the same functionality but different design so the things you can actually do as a full stack developer is absolutely endless and i know that by now you should be very very eager to learn everything from scratch because in as much as everything we just did was exciting if you're just starting you're not yet equipped with every single tool you need to be able to build all of these from scratch but i know that for several people it will take them three four five years to learn all these things because to get to this level you don't get to this level overnight but at least this course helps you know exactly what is possible exactly how you can achieve your goals and exactly how you deal to build a full stack application so in the programmers university a program basically takes you from absolute beginner to be able to build this kind of application in less than 12 months so for the first six months you're going to be learning the theory learning all the explanation doing a ton of exercises for you to understand how all of this works and the next six months are going to be just for building projects just for building such real world applications and it's thanks to this application that you're going to be able to learn opportunities like land clients learn freelance gigs and also learn jobs because nowadays employers are basically looking for people who can build such things rather than people who only have pieces of papers saying that they have learned the thing but cannot prove it by building an application so in the programmers university we basically hold your hand from scratch and teach you all the necessary skills for you to be able to get to this level in less than 12 months instead of taking four years five years like people typically do on their own so this is all about this our full stack application and i really hope you enjoyed this session and now our web app is fully built imagine creating something like this just after a few months of learning i know so many people who have taken three four five years or even up to eight years like me to learn how to code but once you join a very structured program, you can learn how to code in less than six months and start building such applications. One thing I want you to take note of is that the app we built today is just a small example of the project you'll be working on as part of our program at the Programmers University. Now that we've finished building the full stack application in less than no time, I know you're ready to take the next step. You've seen what's possible, you've heard my story and seen that becoming a developer is achievable with the right resources and the right guidance. So now here's the deal. I'm inviting you to join our full stack development program at the Programmers University and in just six months, you learn everything you need to become a full stack developer. You learn everything from front end, back end, databases, APIs and so much more throughout the program. You will work on real world projects just like the app we built today and graduate ready to start applying for jobs 
freelancing, or even building your very own tech startup with the skills you acquired. And the best part is the projects you're going to build throughout the program can be projects you will use to show employers directly after graduating. And these projects are projects that are going to be fair to in order to consider you as a strong candidate for the job. So after the program, you can get directly to earning with the skills you've learned throughout the program. And of course, we do not only focus on technical skills because we know that not everyone know how to prepare for interviews. So we also prep you up for interviews, show you how to build your resume, help you build a complete portfolio which is very attractive for potential recruiters or potential clients and prep you up so you can be ready for the real world market. Right now, we are offering a special offer for those who want to enroll in the upcoming program. The full price for this program is $350, which can be paid in your local currency. Or you can choose to pay in installments, and we offer three installment plans of $120 throughout the program. There is no upfront cost beyond that. Even after the program, you can still get help from our mentors. You can still ask questions and join our community of alumni where we share regular opportunities from other companies who want to recruit our students. So the value you're getting is not only while you're in the program, it's also after you graduate from this program. So this is so much value you're getting from literally just sacrificing what you would have sacrificed to do something that wouldn't really help your life in the long term. So spaces fill up very quickly each batch. So we want to make sure that we can follow up every student. So there is a very limited amount of students we can take each batch. Make sure to join as soon as possible because we are soon closing the registrations for the next upcoming batch. If you are ready to join us today, click on the link below to chat with us directly on WhatsApp. Our team will help you through the registration, payments, and any questions you might have. Or if you're excited but need more time, you can join our waitlist and you'll be the first to get notified when the next batch starts. So just a reminder that you have two options. You can either click below and enroll and start your developer journey or join the waitlist for our next cohort. I'm really excited to see where your journey takes you. And I really want to congratulate you because you've taken the very first step by attending this webinar. And I hope that I've shown you that coding is not only possible for you, but is the key to unlocking an amazing future if you actually commit to it. Let me hold your hand and guide you throughout the process just live. I've done it with hundreds of students and I can also do it with you. So let's get started. Click the link below, chat with us and see you in the class.